to do initially is introduce our three presenters to you this evening. We have Rebecca Larmer, who is a European and Olympian trained USDF bronze medalist and internationally certified trainer who believes you must patiently use a positive approach to develop your horse, both mentally and physically, to ensure a happy athlete and partner, whether in the competition ring or on the trails. Rebecca has a background in 4-H, Pony Club, Western, Hunt Seat, Saddle Seat, Gaming, Cow Sorting, Working Equitation, Recreational and Competitive Trail Riding, Showmanship, Lounge Lining, Jumping, Eventing, and Dressage. Because of her diverse background, Rebecca is able to link key information together that is crucial to all disciplines and breeds. Also with us today is Eileen Nessenson. She is the owner of Holistic Horse Body Works and the creator of Stretch Your Horse mobile application. She has been a certified equine body worker and English and Western saddle fitter and English saddle reflocker for over 11 years. She is also certified as a thermal imaging technician and certified in the application of elastic kinesiology tape for horses. Eileen also does body work on dogs. Prior to becoming a body worker, Eileen was an attorney, but she knew her heart always was with animals. Our final presenter this evening is Dr. Steve Sunholm. He has been an equine practitioner for the last 33 years and 38 of those years as a veterinarian. He enjoys all aspects of equine medicine and surgery, but has a special interest in dentistry. Dr. Sunholm is the owner of Echoes Veterinary Service located in Oregon City, Oregon. Dr. Sunholm has taken many extra courses in equine dentistry to supplement his education and enjoys helping horses with their de dental equilib oh, excuse me guys, <laughs> equilibration needs. He passed all levels of certification in the IAED and served as an examiner for this organization, administering dental certification testing for other practitioners across the country. We will we'll be sharing some presentation materials for you today, as well as recording this talk, and we will be making those available on the websites for all of our presenters today, Rebecca Larimer Training, Echoes Veterinary Service, Stretch Your Horse Mobile App, and the Holistic Horse Body Works websites. There is on the top of the, uh, the application here tonight, a little button that says interact, and if you um, We'll just press that right now, all of our attendees. You can let me know if you're hearing things fine. Uh, you can just click on the yes, and that will let me know that. If you have any questions, you can use the chat area on the left of the screen, and you can type the questions that you have. I will be moderating those questions and teeing them up to our presenters as we move through the talk this afternoon. And so now I'm going to move on to go over what our agenda will be today. And what you can see here is that we will begin by looking at what the purpose of a bit is, as well as covering key principles of bit function and key terminology that everyone should know. We'll also be discussing non-leverage versus leverage bits, common snaffle bits, curb bits, the selection criteria, keeping in mind that the horse's comfort is king. We'll be talking a bit about the bitless bridles and the overall effect on the horse's body from bits as well as the effect on mouth and the importance of balance in the mouth. And then we'll wrap up. So if, can everyone see the presentation? It looks like Marla might be having a hard time. Marla might be having some issues. Yes, so, so um, we, will we can email that. Yes. We'll try to resolve it. And uh, we will also email that to you if we need. Is everybody else getting a picture? Um, uh, of the presentation at all. Can someone else reply besides wonderful Marla? Okay, thank Kristen you. Kristen Maxfield is able to see, yes. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn over the talk to our first presenter, which will be Rebecca Larimer. And thank you, Deb. So one of the biggest questions is, what is the purpose of a bit? As you're all aware of, horses are certainly not machines. And we have all experienced us giving a wonderful, perfect cue using our seat and our legs, and our horse completely disregard it or go merrily trying to bound across the arena. 
Hence, you know, it really is nice to have something for backup, for speed control, and for steering your horse. Once again, in an ideal perfect world, you're using your seat and your legs and your horse is listening beautifully with you in harmony. Um, but that's, of course, not always the case. Um, secondly, one of the biggest aspects, especially as your horse is learning new maneuvers, such as side pass, turn on the haunches, turn on the forehand, leg yields, and all of the you know fancy maneuvers, um, it helps teach them how to assist with their body orientation. And one of the things to keep in mind is that all of those uh, upper level movements are actually to help your horse stretch and become more supple and have it be used in more of a therapeutic way. Um, unfortunately, there are people out there that do forget this and overuse the movements. Um, and don't look at it in that aspect. Please kindly remember that it truly is the rider's responsibility to learn how to get out of their horse's way to be able to properly influence them and work in partnership. Uh, we do tend to be micromanagers and especially with our hands and lots of times, you know, it's just so easy to overuse the bit. Um, go ahead, and I am going to turn it over to Eileen. Eileen, are you there? I can't be heard, Rebecca. Oh, okay. Um, Eileen can't be heard. Rebecca, can you... Okay, Eileen, I'm, do you want me to just continue? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay, great. All right. So a key principle to bit function is pressure. Um, the correct bit selection does require understanding um, how a bit functions and works. Um, there are so many different types out there. You know, the pressure points on the horse's head are affected by different bit types and designs. Um, there are many different pressure points depending on the bit, which is why a proper bit selection is so crucial. Uh, they can include the tongue, bars, cheeks, lips, palate, nose, curb area, which is under the chin, and the pole. Um, even a correct bit selection can be um, uh, muffled uh, by a rider's hand, you know, or screwed up. Uh, typically, the biggest reason that horses do have mouth problems are unfortunately due to riders um, not understanding how to ride properly and use less hands um, while they're riding. Um, you know, the one big crucial piece to keep in mind is that the harshest bit can be soft and light in sensitive hands, and the softest bit um sorry uh the softest bit is um harsh and harsh hands so please bear that in mind as we continue um also um just so you guys are aware uh we will be providing this online um so you can go over and not be frantically writing all of this information down. You can go and watch it for free again and be able to write everything and refresh your memory. Um, and there are some key terminology basics, you know, for, um, for bits and the components as we're going through this presentation. Um, one is the cheek piece, which is the side piece that's attached to the mouth. Um, there's the mouthpiece, that's the one that's inside the horse's mouth. Uh, the shank, um, that is regarding a curb um, or a leverage bit. And then um, there are two different basic bit categories. Uh, the non-leverage bit is, you know, are the snapples. The reins do it directly attached to the cheek piece. Um, and then there's the leverage bit, which attach the reins do attach to the bottom of the shank. And we'll be going into more of detail with that in this next slide. So non-leverage versus leverage bit. 
Um, so non-leverage are your snaffles. Anything that directly, you know, what we say is it, direct, it attaches to the mouthpiece or the reins attached to the mouthpiece, which is where the cheeks actually attach to the mouthpiece, not to be confused by that. Um, the pressure of the rider's hands um, is in direct proportion to the uh, pressure or weight on the horse's mouth. So if you pull back, you know, 10 pounds, your horse is feeling 10 pounds of pressure on their mouth, okay? Um, a leverage bit is different in that the amount of pressure in your hands is multiplied in your horse's mouth. So if I pull back 10 pounds, you know, on a four inch shank, that means I'm pulling back 40 pounds about in my horse's mouth, which is a lot. And unfortunately, a lot of people do do this. Um, the rings are once again are attached to the bottom of the shank, which is why um, there is more leverage. And you also have, um, are applying, uh, there's the curb chain pressure and your pull pressure with your leverage bit, not just pressure on the mouth. So it is truly harsher. Um, in theory, all riders from all disciplines should be able to ride their horse properly, which is primarily using their seat and legs. Um, in a snaffle or a bitless bridle at home before needing or having to use a bit due to a competition regulations. Um, you know, in Western, um, unless you're in a young horse or futurity class, you are required to compete in a shank bit. Um, that, that's the rules. It's a Western. You should be in a Western bit. Um, same with the upper level dressage, um, where in current FEI regulations, um, you are supposed to be riding in a double bridle. Uh, they did just change that in the U.S. Um, to where you are permitted to ride in only a snaffle. But currently under international FEI level uh, regulations, you still must ride in a double bridle. But just because that's the regulations, um, you should be, doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to ride at home in a good snaffle. So then, um, let's go over um, all the different common uh, snaffle cheek pieces. I have four of the most common. One's the loose ring, the egg butt, D ring, and full cheek. We'll be going into these in detail. The first one is uh, the loose ring snaffle. These are really nice if you um, have a horse who's a bit heavier in your hand and you need them to be able to get off your hand faster. Um, but they're also, you as a rider also need to be very good and steady in your hands for this bit. Um, Otherwise, if let's say you accidentally have unsteady hands, um, it causes vibration in the bit, okay? And imagine you're the horse and that vibration is like playing rock and roll music and your horse is trying to listen and hear your classical music cues in the background. Um, you know, it is very hard um, it's hard for your horse, and that's why a lot of times, you know, riders are like, gosh darn it, why isn't my horse listening to me? Well, it's probably because uh, we as riders get to, you know, are always learning and get to enhance our uh, riding ability to where we can be as soft and quiet and effective as possible so our horses can actually hear our cues and what we're asking them to do. Uh, this is why I, re I do not recommend this ring um, for beginner riders. Um, you're a beginner. You know, it would be normal that you're, you know, you're learning. Your hands are not going to be as steady, um, especially as you're finding your balance more and more. And you really need a very soft, steady, and elastic contact, uh, contact um, with your horse's mouth for this bit which beginning riders just do not have yet. Um, and just so you're aware, if you ever hear the word elastic or elasticity, um, having a nice elastic contact with your horse, 
that's like the rubber band effect um, that happens through your elbows where um, you're having a nice supple feel and not a rock hard steady uh, feeling in your horse's mouth. Um, once again, um, these, this is great for horses who like more contact. Um, the pressure releases faster. Um, my sensitive horses, um, they just don't care for this. Um, it, the, they just find it too unstable and uh, they're not as willing to trust a nice soft contact, even if I'm being perfect, okay? Um, it's one of those things I have found. Um, Rebecca, so yeah, could I, I wanna pause. could I, yeah, Rebecca, and, could I pause you a second yeah, and see ahead. if Eileen's been able to resolve her technical issue and join us on the call. Eileen, are you there? Eileen just went out to the car to see if she could get a, a battery for her phone. Uh, we're okay. We're able to hear you through the phone, not the computer. Okay, great. Oh, but you can okay. hear us and we can hear you now. So thank you, Dr. Sunho. Okay. Great. So while they are taking care of that on that side, I will continue. Fortunately, I have lots to go over. <laughs> okay. So um, the next two different um, di uh, direct contact or um, non-leverage snapples are the egg butt and the D-ring. What most people do not realize is that these are basically the same exact bits. Um, the egg butt was made in the UK, and the US decided, hey, we really, really like that. We need to make our own version. So hence the D-ring came out. Um, so they, um, they have a nice um, block on the side to where the horse's lips can't get pinched. Um, it does have a much steadier feeling in your hands. Uh, this is why I really do like these for beginner riders. Uh, there's less va vibration in your horse's mouth. Um, sensitive and so soft mouth and young horses really seem to accept this bit and enjoy the feeling a lot more um, than the, um, the O-ring or the loose ring snaffle. Um, just because it gives a steadier, more consistent feel that uh, they tend to trust more. Um, I do pref typically prefer the D-ring um, because lots of times the ring, uh, sorry, the ring, uh, when I give them a long rein um, to have a break, when I go to pick up the reins, the loop at the end of the reins gets caught on that point of the D-ring. Uh, which is really annoying to have to stop and fix. So I avoid the D-ring altogether and just use an egg butt. That's what works for me. Um, the next one is the full cheek snaffle. Um, it is actually very similar to an egg butt and a D-ring. The only difference is it has the long straight bars that extend so that it's harder to pull the bit through the mouth. Now, honestly, if you're pulling on your horse's mouth so hard that you're pulling the bit through, something's not going right. But it is very helpful, especially if you are, you know, doing something more like three-day eventing cross-country um, and you're wanting a little bit extra backup to make sure nothing like that happens. Um, it is nice for beginner riders as well for the same reason as the Ed Bet and the D-Ring. Um, and also for the sensitive and soft mouth horses, um, like I said, the biggest thing is just not pulling it through your horse's mouth. Um, you know, I've heard some people say it can help direct the nose uh, of your horse to help with turns and steering. Um, you know, it can help with that as well for a bit. So then we go into our curb or uh, leverage bit cheek, cheek pieces. Um, we're going to go through really two different uh, curb types in each, um, for English and for Western. Um, please remember these, all of these bits that we're going, or the cheek pieces um, are more severe due to leverage, pull, and chin strap put pressure. Also, uh, please bear in mind that the longer the shank is of the bit, it means that it's more severe for all of these bits. 
Okay, here, thank you, Rebecca. Marla. Yeah, here. Is this Rebecca, better at all, Marla? Can, yeah, you're coming across Please. a little garbled. Um, okay, no, thank you. Is this any better? Um, I can keep talking and please let me know if it is better or worse. Um, Sounds better. So, okay, perfect. Thank you, Marla, for letting us know. I am glad to accommodate. Um, so here, um, please just make, remember that for all of these leverage bits, um, if the rain attaches lower down from the mouthpiece, um, the lower it is, the harsher the bit. Okay, and so the writer's hands are critical for all of it, but most especially these because of the increase in pressure. So we're first gonna go over the two first common uh, cheek, yeah, you're welcome. Um, you're the, for the most common cheek pieces for English um, leverage bits. Um, the first one is called a, a Kimberwick. Um, it is an English leverage bit, it is not legal in all disciplines, including dressage. So please check your local uh, regulations for the specific shows you want to enter. Um, if you use it for better breaks, um, it means that you know the horse and rider really need to practice uh, with half halts from their seat and their legs, okay? Um, I see this a bit a lot in open shows and 4-H. Um, and it, it is easier, quite frankly, to get your horse's head down and, you know, quote, in a frame uh, due to the pull and chain pressure. The thing is, is that most of the kids or people who uh, ride in this bit, if you put them in a normal snaffle, um, all of a sudden their horse's head and neck are up in the air. They don't know how to actually connect their horse properly. Um, and so, you know, it. If you have to ride in this bit, it really means that the horse and rider need to practice um, and gain more knowledge to learn how to have proper connection, if that is why they are using this bit. Um, it is not made for constant contact. Um, you know, imagine if you're a horse, you have this pain uh, pressure, you know, underneath your chin, and um, and then, you know, some of the pull pressure, uh, you would not want that on your, uh, on your mouth at all or your chin. So uh, please make sure to, um, this is a bit to have a little bit of a floppier rein or contact, um, unlike in dressage. All right. So then the next one is the English Pelham. Um, typically, you just hear it called a Pelham. Um, please, once again, check your local show regulations to see uh, when or if it is legal. Uh, once again, in a dressage competition, it is not. Um, I will say this bit is really nice for show jumping or uh, cross country if you're needing to um, have a bit more breaks during your ride. Um, you should be able to train at home to where you're able to just use a snaffle and your first few shows, you might want to put this in to be able to make sure you have better breaks, possibly, but in a perfect world, you're able to still just use your snaffle. Um, but, uh, I, I am not opposed to using this bit if and when necessary, but with the goal of getting softer and lighter bits down the road as my horse starts listening more and more, especially in a horse show environment. And, um, you know, they do like to uh, be more forward. Um, the next is uh, the Western Pelham. It, uh, in a funky way, almost looks like the English Pelham, uh, where I'm sure um, some wonderful Western people in this day and age said, hey, that would be a great idea. Um, it is also called a double rein bit, as since you can actually switch your reins from the curb ring, which is the lower ring, and then bring it up to the upper ring, um, which is near the mouthpiece there. Um, 
you still do uh, really just use one set of reins. Um, otherwise, some Western people might look at you funny using two reins, and that does require, um, um, you know, being more uh, advanced and finesse to be able to ride with two reins. Um, you want to use the snaffle rein for a much milder pressure, um, and it's closer to a non-levered snaffle bit. Um, but, um, you know, you still have a bit of the chin piece, sorry, the chain pressure underneath their chin. And so I don't really, it's certainly milder, but I'd still recommend using a true snaffle bit for primary training. I know that a lot of the top Western trainers do uh, primarily train in snaffle bits. And then a week or two before a show, um, they will um, train in their uh, shank bit to make sure their horse is okay. Um, you know, and then of course, once in a while, uh, but really try and use your snaffle bit more often to help keep your horse's mouth more soft and supple. Uh, this type of bit is most definitely made for a long, loose, uh, floppy reins and not consistent contact. If you accidentally are, or purposefully, um, then you are just making your horse's mouth harder and um, they're going to get um, worse in your hand, not better. Um, and the whole goal of riding is getting softer, lighter, uh, more harm uh, a better harmony uh, ride and consistency together. Um, your typical Western, uh, these are your typical Western shanks. Uh, sometimes they look really pretty and really flashy. Uh, and I love it. I love the silver bling. I actually miss it now that I'm more of a pure dressage rider. Um, the longer the shank equals it's more severe. And you can certainly find um, western shank bits out there easily six plus inches long which means that's six times the pressure in your hand um there are a lot of different types they do you know and they can look different and everything just really keep in mind the basic mechanics are the same the longer the shank the harsher it is okay it keeps life really simple um, once again, I do recommend riding and primarily training in a snaffle or bitless bridle. Um, and then, yes, practice with your shank bit um, once in a while to keep your horse fresh and uh, ready to, you know, jump into a show ring when you want to. Um, but this is also made for a long, loose reins, not a consistent contact by any means. Um, and please bear that in mind. Okay, so now, uh, now that we've gone over your leverage bits and your non-leverage or your uh, shanks versus your um, let's get into the mouthpieces. All and right. before you do that, Rebecca, yes. we do have a question from Ann Hoy and Camus, wanting to know if there's a difference between a snaffle that has a joint or lozenge in the middle and one that does not. Ooh, okay, well, thank you, Ann. Um, so, if you bear with me for a moment, um, I will be getting to that mouthpiece in just a moment, okay? Um, and then please let me know if I do not answer that question well enough. Um, you know, once I, I think that's just the very next slide, so thank you for your question. Um, so the, the big thing is nowadays with how we're able to so easily manufacture bits, you really have to separate the cheek pieces and then combine it with the, the mouthpiece of your choice. You can almost find any mouthpiece that you would want on a shank bit as you would want on a snaffle, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, all of the shanks that we just, or the cheek pieces that we just went over, now you could input any of these mouthpieces on any of those shanks is the easiest way to put it, okay? Um, so one of the common mouthpieces is a molen mouth. 
Uh, a molar mouth is a bit that just goes straight across, nice and easy. Uh, it doesn't have any curve in it. Um, and a molar mouth or very low ports, and the port is the middle of the bit where it goes up, um, it applies, applies very minimal pressure to the tongue and also to the palate, which is the top of the horse's mouth. Um, horses do typically like to have a slight curve um, in their bit, um, especially with the shank bit, um, in order to have room for their tongue. Um, please keep in mind the higher the port or the middle of the bit, like um, the medium port with the roller is the most severe on this page. Um, and actually that one's pretty mild. Um, I have a picture of a really harsh bit um, later that you get to see. Um, so the higher that is, the more severe it is, okay? Uh, too high of a port, it hits the horse's palate um, which, of course, would really, really hurt. Um, one thing to keep in mind as well is are some of the mouthpieces, um, they might be completely solid, clear across, or you might be able to kind of swivel them. Um, I know my, uh, it seems to be that most horses kind of prefer to have a swivel because um, it, it has a bit more give and flexibility um, and feels less stiff in their mouth. Okay, so please let me know if you have any questions with that, and then I will get to, oh, sorry, Anne, not just yet. <laughs> next slide. Um, so then, the next uh, mouthpiece is the single jointed snaffle. This is the one where there is one joint in the middle of it. It will have a nutcracker action where it can hit the top of the palate. Um, and, you know, and it pinch the barbs of the horse's mouth if and when it's ever pulled too hard. So it can definitely not feel good. Um, in fact, I find that most horses don't prefer this bit. Um, understandably so, it is not my favorite because of that. Um, but of course, there's always the exception to the rule. I have a horse right now in training who, you know, I tried the double jointed snaffle, which I'll get to in just a moment. And he didn't like it, and he preferred this one. And so um, I use it because he told me he likes this one. Um, don't get me wrong, we'll get, um, I'll give you signs of how does a horse tell you that they don't like the bit, okay? And, um, and uh, more towards the end of this. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that there's the do-it-yourself uh, single joint bit check, all right? So all you have to do is pinch the top of the joint and let the bit hang down. If you look at the cheek pieces and they hang uneven, you know the manufacturer made a mistake. So before you go to a tax store, or, or when you go to a tax store and you're going to buy a single jointed snaffle, um, do this check first, okay? Um, it needs to be even across. Otherwise, how are you supposed to balance your horse with an unbalanced bit? All right. All right, the double jointed snaffles. Um, so um, there are three main double jointed snaffles. Um, there is the oval mouth, or you can, they also say it has a lozenge in the middle. There's the French link and the Dr. Bristol. Um, honestly, in the beginning, a French link and a Dr. Bristol look pretty, the, pretty much the same. The biggest thing is that the Dr. Bristol is tap, typically has a longer plate across. It takes up more of the mouthpiece. And it's also at a sharper angle. So when you use the bit, it um, kind of, um, digs into the tongue a little bit more. So it definitely is, you know, it puts more pressure on the tongue. And so it is a harsher bit than the French link. Um, I have never found a horse that likes the Dr. Bristol yet. Um, there's probably is a horse out there. Um, but, um, you know, you can try it. Go ahead. I just haven't found a horse yet that prefers that. 
Now, uh, what are my two favorite uh, mouthpieces? Uh, the French link and the oval mouth are my absolute two best favorite. And why are they my favorite? Um, it's because the horses like it. So I like it if my horse likes it. Um, the French link is actually the mildest of the two. It's smooth um, it, uh, and lies flat on your horse's tongue. Um, the oval mouth uh, is a bit rounder. It does lie smooth on your horse's mouth. Um, it is a little bit more severe than the French link, but it still is um, a very nice, soft, mild bit. And the horses just seem to really go well in it, or most horses. Of course, there's always the exception to the rule. Um, and then if there are more than two joints in your bit, that means that it's more severe, okay? Uh, so that is one thing to keep in mind. There are a lot of other uh, bits out there where that you'll see the mouthpieces have many links, uh, same with the chain. Um, uh, you know, as far as a chain in a horse's mouth, that means it's really, really severe. So please keep that in mind when you're selecting your bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, Anne, I hope I answered your question, and please let me know if I did not. So there are several things to think of um, when you're looking at a bit, okay? There is the cheek piece, and once again, you can combine any of those mouth pieces we just went over to just about any of the cheek pieces, okay? Um, it's kind of a cut and paste thing when you go to your local tax store. It's crazy at how many different varieties there are, and that's why there is an insane wall of bits when you go there. Um, the average horse's mouthpiece length um, is five inches, okay? So the mouthpiece needs to be um, long enough so that it doesn't pinch the corners and the soft, fleshy area of your horse's lips, but it needs to be no more than one half of an inch on either side of the horse's mouth, okay? My easy check on that is just slide my pointer fingers on both sides and I should be able to do that. Okay, with the horse, with the bit in the horse's mouth. Um, one of the items are rollers. Um, there are bits out there that have rollers in them, uh, English and Western bits. Um, some horses like them, and, you know, especially if they like to play for something or if they need to get their minds off, you know, their busy brain. And some horses couldn't care less, and some just don't like them. Um, so, you know, it's up to you whether you want to try a roller in. Um, I typically just don't. Uh, the mouthpiece diameter, you know, or how wide or how thin should, thick or thin should your bit be? be. Uh, it's really like a Goldilocks syndrome. Um, if it's too thin, um, you know, that means the bit's really harsh, okay? And it's going to dig into your horse's lips and gums and the tongue. If it's too thick though, it can also be harsh, okay? So one of the things that you can check, you know, is, um, so, you know, is my bit too thick? Well, with the bit in, open the lips of, of, lips of your horse. If the bit is too thick, typically the tongue uh, will be sticking through the teeth and they're not going to be able to close their mouth, all right? Um, I have had it, it was with my lesson horse, you know, have a nice thick bit in his mouth, you know, to have it be nice and soft. And, you know, he just opened his lips up and I saw his tongue sticking out and uh, put in a smaller diameter bit and he was fine and he was able to close his mouth. Um, of course, there's always the exception to the rule. I had a wonderful client today whose uh, horse had the same thing. She has a nice diameter bit in um, and her horse still kind of likes to stick his tongue out. Fortunately, his lips close around his tongue so you can't actually tell. Um, but, you know, it is always entertaining with horses because there are exceptions to every rule. Um, so 
Um, typically about 18 millimeters uh, works well for most for most horses on average for your bit diameter. Um, one thing that's really um, harder, you know, because I was looking at Dover um, salary um, and for the shank bits, it doesn't say what the diameter of the bit is. So I would recommend um, contacting customer support or um, you, um, you know, or when you're at your tax store, go, wow, does this bit look really thin or really thick? I just want to err on either of the two extremes. Um, in English bits, they post the millimeters on. <laughs> okay, so then uh, bit material. Um, one of the, uh, well, it used to be really common is copper. Uh, the horses like it, it helps them to salivate, um, you know, but it's a very, very soft metal by itself. And what people found is that the horses can chomp on it and actually dent the metal and create some sharp points and then you need to get a new bit. So we pretty well um, avoid that. Um, stainless steel is extremely popular nowadays. It's shiny, it cleans up great, it's strong. Um, you know, horses tend to go, in, uh, you know, with it pretty well. The less expensive bits are made out of it. Um, you know, it's still not their absolute favorite. Um, sweet iron, uh, horses like it, they salivate great. It's a stronger metal. The downside is it rusts and it looks really ugly, really fast. And it's like, why are you putting a rusty bit in your horse's mouth? Um, you know, so it just doesn't have as great of a look. Um, what's really popular nowadays um, are the metal blends. The blends do depend on the manufacturer. And of course, um, because there's more science involved in it, they're more expensive typically. Um, I mean, they look great. The horses like it. It has some copper. It has some of the stainless steel in it and stuff. Um, but of course, the price difference is huge. Um, the nice metal blend, one of my favorite manufacturers, it's about $100 bit. The same concept in the stainless steel is like $35. Of course, the metal blend one um, has a bit more science involved in it, which the horses do like. Um, then the rubber, uh, rubber mouthpieces. Um, you know, they are softer um, than metal um, on, you know, so on your horse's mouth, as long as they don't crack or split or get rubbed somehow and get sharp edges on them. So you really need to be careful with the rubber bits. Um, you know, I, I typically avoid them on a day-to-day -day basis, but I do have a really nice uh, rubber pellum. You'll actually see it in a bit. Um, that is nice that I would use a first country with a, a, a horse that I'm taking out for a first time, you know, our first few times on a cross country course. Um, so it's a, it's a, I have more breaks, but yet it's still nice and soft in their mouth. Um, then there are uh, different chin straps. Uh, chin straps, they're used for leverage bits. They're used for all of them. Um, leather, you can get a straight across leather uh, chin strap, which would be the mildest for Western. Um, you can get a chain um, and have it with rubber or put a gel um, uh, across for the, um, for the mildest for English. And then you also have a single chain and a double chain, which would be stronger. Um, please inspect your bit every three months for dents, deep scratches, sharp edges, lack of symmetry, et cetera, that can cause pain, cuts, sores, or lack of business. Um, now the great thing is hopefully with all of this knowledge, um, you are able to uh, then be able to just about combine any cheek piece with whatever mouthpiece your horse prefers with more knowledge. Um, you know, you have your egg butt uh, with the metal over mouth, uh, metal oval mouth snaffle, 
You have the oval mouth with the loose ring down just down below it. There are lots of different options out there and hopefully this has been able to help clarify it a bit about just why there are so many different bits hanging on the wall at tax stores and what you can do to help uh, you find the best fit for your horse. Um, really, my best uh, two go-to bits uh, on this page would be the top left for your snaffle, this nice egg butt with the oval mouthpiece. Lots of horses tend to go in it really well. And then for my Western shank bit, I really like this one on the bottom right. Um, it's a mixed metal. Um, it only has a three inch shank, so it's not too long. Um, you know, and then it has a nice low port uh, that the horses seem to really like and appreciate. Um, here are some bits that your horse absolutely positively does not need. Um, one of those things it falls in the category are twisted wire. Um, I know we had a question from Anne about what is a slow twist bit and, and what is its function. Um, it basically is just a harsher bit, okay? Um, the, it has more pressure on the horse's tongue and um, it uh, hurts them, okay? Um, all of these are bad examples. Uh, please, if you are your horse trainer, feel your horse needs any of these, there is a dental, body work, veterinary, saddle fit, or training issue. Uh, what about bitless bridles? Really, there are a lot of different bitless bridles. Um, the general function is applying pressure on nose, skin, and face. Um, you know, they can be great for horses with a bad past. You need to be careful with them. Uh, you can still hurt your horse and crush their molars and nasal bones. Um, and the biggest thing is, are you able to, you know, still properly influence your horse and be their physical therapist? And now I'm going to bring it over to Eileen. Thanks, Rebecca. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, as Rebecca was talking about, there's an infinite amount of uh, bits that you can choose from. But regardless of whether you're riding in a snaffle uh, or you're riding in a curb or a leverage bit, there are some indications that the bit you're riding in may not be right for your horse um, beyond the mouth. What can happen in terms of the whole body is if the bit is incorrect or if it's too harsh or if it's unbalanced, the horse um, can actually start to tilt its head and then it can end up with, you know, TMJ kind of issues. It can end up with a lot of neck pain, tightness in the muscles on the neck. And once that starts happening, you get a ripple effect all the way down the horse's body. So oftentimes, um, when I find an issue when I'm doing body work on a horse with the neck, I start asking when was the last dental, I start asking about the bit, and once we get that corrected, then we can correct the body work. And I have Dr. Sundholm sitting next to me giving me a big thumbs up for that. Um, because it's really true. You can have the best trainer, and Rebecca is an amazing trainer, and you can have the best body worker and the best fit saddle, but fundamentally, if you've got a bit issue causing dental issues, all of that is going to be negated. Um, also, the horse can start running around with its head up in the air trying to evade the bit and end up with a hollow, very sore back. So there's a, just a knock-on or ripple effect all the way down the horse's body from an ill-fitting or uh, uncomfortable bit. Uh, the horse can refuse to move forward. It can start bucking, rearing. Uh, occasionally I've had horses that didn't want to change leads, and it turned out it stemmed from a dental and a bit issue. Um, the other thing, of course, there are direct effects on the mouth, so the horse can start flicking its tongue in and out, it can stick its tongue out, uh, the teeth don't come together, so you can end up with you know, very local effects as well as ripple effects down the whole body. Now, that said, any of these signs could be 
other issues too. So don't jump to a conclusion that just because your horse's neck is sore, there's something wrong with the bit. Investigate, look at the issues, look at the horse, look at the bit, and try and do some detective work to figure out what's what's going on. Generally speaking, if a horse is in tune with their bit, you're going to feel that soft, flex, suppling. They're going to come, um, you know, over their back, through the head, and they're going to be moving really, really well. And you will feel it when there is an issue, even if you're not an experienced rider. Generally speaking, um, you'll know right away, and so if the horse is unhappy with the bit, take it out and remove it right then and there. Um, otherwise, go ahead and try it for, you know, anywhere from three to seven days and see what happens. And you may have to experiment with a couple, three different bits. I know, uh, you know, with my current horse, I had to do just that. And once we found one he really liked, it was immediate. So even if you're not an experienced rider, you will feel the difference. And you can also get your trainer to help you make this decision about what bit is going to be right for your horse. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sunholm to talk about the direct effect on the horse's mouth. Thank you. Well, as we can see, there's many types of bits to use, and these bits uh, could be the result or fixing a problem, or you could blame it on the bit. But sometimes it's not the bit at all. And uh, for that, I, I think it's appropriate to look elsewhere. And I, I look at the teeth. Um, and then, so why do we look at the teeth? Well, there's there's several things. Um, you know, pain is one thing. I mean, ulcers, TMJ syndrome, diseased teeth, you know, is one. Feed efficiency, everybody wants their horses to uh, grind their food enough to uh, eat and get enough calories so they can perform properly. Um, performance is in another uh, category, and that's bit comfort, headset, uh, turning ability, which is I, I didn't really realize that until I started looking for it. <clears throat> and then if we can uh, also get into longevity of the teeth, uh, even forces on the teeth promote even wear, and then that in turn will make the teeth last longer. We want our horses to still have their teeth when they're 30 years old and not have to feed them mush because all their teeth are falling out. So when I first approach uh, looking at the teeth, I, I try to go for history um, from the owners, see what their complaints or problems are, and do a good oral exam to try to identify any of these abnormalities. And a lot of times the people say, oh, yeah, the horse is eating just fine, or he's quitting, which is dropping food, he's packing food in his cheeks. Um, sometimes they have a, a headset problem where their nose is too far up in the air. Um, sometimes they just play with the bit. Um, Another one that, that came up over years of, of doing all this stuff is the turning ability and picking up leads and bending one direction easier than another direction. So I started paying attention to more of that. Head shaking, um, you know, especially like with a cabasson on, uh, bouncing your head up and down. And, of course, we get into the foul-smelling odors from their mouth. You know, you can think of something else going on, attitude problems. Um, a lot of people complained that they thought that their horse had a hormone problem because of the bad attitude when they rode them. Um, well, it turns out that there's other things going on. So after listening to all these concerns and then identifying some abnormal teeth anatomy, I started to make some combinations of, of, of a pattern, you know, of symptoms and, and teeth abnormalities. So the, the quitting or dropping the food, or packing food in their teeth, usually is points. Um, points are the sharp edges, or sharp points that form on the outside edge of the uppers and inside edge of the lowers. Um, it could be just a painful tooth, you know, to where they actually pack food around that tooth, or pack food around the sharp points as a protective mechanism. The headset problems, usually it's the nose up and out, is the, the usual confirmation of it. The, the jaw is in the back position, which is more comfortable for them. So if you ever try to lift your horse's head up, just push up you know, on the jaw all the way, stick his nose up in the air, look what the jaw does. 
the jaw moves back. And then you lower the head and the jaw moves forward. So there has to be front to back motion for that horse to be comfortable moving. Every discipline that you use with your horse, I think, needs to be able to flex at the pole. I mean, look at barrel racers. That, you know, to get the tightest turn around the barrel, they need to tuck their head and turn sharply. Uh, jumping horses, you know, as you're moving along right before the jump, you collect them so that they round up a little bit, get their hind end underneath them so they have to collect the pole or round at the pole, their neck rounds, their back rounds, gets their rear end underneath them so you get the power to go over a jump. Uh, dressage horses, they have extended trots where their head might be out, but they also have collected trots. Even the trail horses that are up in the mountains, you know, you got to be able to watch the trail, look over the logs, not fall off the cliff, you know, that kind of stuff. So yeah, every horse needs to be able to flex at the pole. So any of these mallet pillusions that can prevent the rostral caudal motion or front-to-back motion, it's mostly moving the jaw forward is what's going to mess you up. So hooks is an overlap front-to-back um, so there's a uh, malocclusion to where the tooth does not hit the bottom tooth or the top tooth when the mouth closes. So it's an overlap. Ramps are kind of look like a ski jump. Usually that's on the front of the arcade or the back of the arcade, so the first tooth or the last tooth. Excessive transverse ridges or ridges that form across the tooth. Um, transverse ridges are normal, but if they get to excessive, like taller than three millimeters, you know, that can trap the jaw in one spot. Steps are... One tooth is too tall. Missing teeth have uh, gaps in there where the opposing tooth wants to uh, fill in that that uh, space. Another problem that people talked about was uh, just playing with the bit. Well, wolf teeth can be a problem there, so um, uh, we have to address those hooks. Or is that overlap front to back? Uh, some of them hold the bit. If the bit is not comfortable for them, they'll just grab the thing and hold it between their teeth. Uh, a lot of these... Uh, multi-linked snaffle bits are floppy enough in the mouth that they can gather them up and grab them with their teeth and they just kind of hold them there. And the first cheek teeth in there where it contacts the bit, they actually get wore out. They'll make grooves in them if, if they're able to do that. Bit seats can kind of help, help prevent that. Um, we'll talk about those in a minute. Turning ability was the thing that surprised me the most and I was most intrigued by it. And They'll, they'll complain that they have a, a turn that's one direction is easier than the other, one that one area is stiffer, one side is stiffer. Um, when I looked at the mouth for the abnormalities, it's diagonal incisors or, or a rotated palate, and both of them contribute to that. Usually the jaw sits off center, and it's in the direction that will be the, the easier turn. So if you look you know, stand straight in front of your horse, look at the jaw, and see if the, the incisor occlusal angle from side to side is level with the forehead. If it's not, uh, you have a diagonal. The incisors that are the, uh, the mandible and the lower teeth, if they're too tall on one, one side or the other, the jaw will actually shift that direction, and that's the direction the horse will turn easier to. It took me years and years to figure this out, but it was a combination of asking the people what the problem was and then looking at the teeth and finding out that there was a consistent, you know, 90% of the time, consistent um, uh, abnormality. So now I can actually look at the horse and say, I bet your horse turns better to the left. And the people look at me and say, how did you know that? And it, it's, it's in the teeth. So I'm trying to address that kind of stuff, too. Head shaking is another thing that they complained about. Uh, they bounce their head up and down. Sometimes those hooks are involved. Sometimes it's a wolf teeth. Any malocclusion that prevents the front to back motion will also do that. But another thing that I found is that the incisor occlusal angle is too straight steep, and that's front to back. So this one, you look at the side view of your horse, look at the occlusal angle of where the incisors come together, and it should be a plane that you could extend all the way up, and it should hit the TMJ, which is a little bit right below the ears. If that angle extends too far, too steep, let's say that the angle extends up and hits the forehead or the bridge of the nose, that angle is too steep, and it won't allow the jaw to move forward 
creating a trapping of the jaw when you ask that horse to round up and collect. That was another one that was just surprising. So I'm paying real close attention to the incisor angle. Foul smells in the mouth, uh, that's more common things. Uh, usually loose teeth, fractured teeth, periodontal disease. Sometimes you had a missing tooth and you have food that's packed in that, uh, that pocket and it kind of rots there, so you get a foul smell. Attitude problems, I think it's anything that's painful. Um, abscess teeth can just create a, you know, a bad attitude. TMJ syndrome, if a horse could get a headache, which I think they do, um, from any of these now occlusions that cause their jaw to be trapped, <clears throat> I think they get a TMJ syndrome, and that can, can cause them to have an attitude problem. I have fixed many, many horses where the people said that the horse was, their whole attitude changed, they're much happier after we balanced them out. <clears throat> I had one client that um, swore up and down that her horse had a hormone problem because um, of, of the bad attitude when they rode it. It wouldn't move forward. It uh, it was always shaking her head. It, um, it was just, it just wasn't happy. Um, I did the hormone test on it, but also fixed the teeth, and all the hormones came out normal, and her teeth were abnormal, and she said that she's never had a better lesson ever, ever after I fixed the teeth. So, horses' teeth continually grow or erupt until their mid-20s. So they're, they're not like our teeth. Our teeth, we get them in when they're about 18 years old and you're, you're done. you got to save them. These, these teeth on the horse continually grow, different kind of tooth, but they continually wear off at the same rate that they erupt. So we know that we're just going to have continued maintenance on them if they get um, points that we have to take off, or we can use that to our advantage to help, help correct imbalances. So that's where our floating versus the collaboration dentistry comes into play. Floating is just the removing of those points that we find on the outside edge of the upper teeth, the inside edge of the lower teeth. Uh, sometimes we can get some outside edge of the lower teeth, but those are usually caused by those transverse ridges that grow across the tooth. Um, floating is fine if you're just we're trying to maintain a horse that's already balanced. Some horses have great mouths anyway, genetically. Um, some of the best mouths I've found have been the horses that come off of the BLM uh, rangelands where they get to eat and walk, walk and eat, head down all the time, and they're eating a live plant, which is what a horse is supposed to do. When we decided to feed it dried hay, grains, concentrates, mashes, all kinds of things, that changes the chewing stroke in the horse's mouth. The biggest stroke comes from a live plant eating grass, and they grind their teeth with the moisture content of the grass being perfect. Once we've dried things, um, the, the chewing stroke changes. It shortens up. They have to chew harder and shorter, strength, shorter strokes. Grains are shorter yet. Pellets is almost an up-and-down motion. If we want to get into the coloration dentistry, which is what I promote more. It's the same floating. Sure, we're going to take care of the points, um, but we're also going to work on the occlusal surfaces of the cheek teeth and those incisor teeth, trying to balance that rostrocaudal motion, front to back motion, and side to side motion. And we might have to extract some things if, you know, if the uh, need arises. And since we have that continued eruption of the teeth until their mid-20s, um, we can help fix some of these malocclusions by taking down the long teeth, the overlong ones, to a normal occlusal length or normal exposed crown length, and then allow the short tooth to, to grow up to meet that other tooth that was already too long. And we can actually fix problems over over years' time. So if we, if we look at the cheek teeth, we're going to address those overlong teeth, the hooks, the waves, the ramps, the steps, the transverse ridges, paying super close attention to the occlusal angle of those cheek teeth. Usually the angles on average is like 12 to 15 degrees, but the, the biggest part is that we need to keep those opposing teeth parallel with each other, and that's going to be super important when we try to balance the incisors uh, when we get to the front of the mouth. Moving a little bit forward, bit seats are, are another thing that we can help them with. 
Um, and that's just a slight rounding of the front surface of the first jig teeth, both top and bottom. Um, it's, it's not a, a grinding of a groove or a slot or anything that, you know, bit seed is kind of a bad name for it, but, but that's what it is. Just a slight rounding of that surface. It prevents the pinching of the soft tissue um, with the, when the bit gathers it up and pushes it into the teeth. Pull, pull apart their, their lower lip back there about where the commissure of their mouth is, where the, the bit's going to lay. And look at all the fleshy tissue back there and that, the, that the bit lays on. And that kind of gets gathered up and pushed into the tooth. So some of these bits that have constant contact or back and forth contact, you're actually pinching some of that soft tissue. Sometimes the, the bit is going to contact the tooth um, all by itself. And if we have a rounded surface with the rounded bit, there's not as harsh of a reaction that goes on. Moving a little bit more forward in the mouth, wolf teeth. Um, they're just little tiny teeth that usually sit in front of those first cheek teeth. Um, the bit kind of bangs into them. They have little tiny roots on them. They wiggle. They hurt. It, you just get rid of them. Uh, there's no real good purpose for them. Canine teeth are another thing that we got to pay, pay attention to. Um, Gildims and stallions are the ones that get the canine teeth, the long... They're, they're long, they have a real dramatic root on them, they're sharp, um, boys have them to fight with. Um, so we usually just blunt the tips on them so that we don't have a, a, a sharp edge or tip to, to deal with. That prevents um, you know, the, the bit um, from banging into them for length as it goes back. Um, helps my fingers when I stick my fingers in their mouth, you know, they don't need to be fighting. Um, you know, with the, with the sharp things. Mares can get them too, about 20% of mares, but they're real tiny little things. Uh, sometimes they're needle sharp, we just kind of take the tips of those off. Um, there's a question here about... Um, bitless uh, question bitless about bridles. bridles. Your opinion on those, Dr. Sundholm? Um, they're fine. Um, if you, you still need the the teeth to be in, in occlusion correctly with the, the raising and lower of their head. They still have to collect themselves. Uh, they still have to put their head up and down. Um, they do that with or without a bit. Uh, the, the head will, um, the, the jaw moves, you know, back when it goes up and forward when it comes down. Uh, turning ability, you're still going to have the same thing. Hopefully the horse has got his mouth closed all the time and the incisors are going to be more important to uh, uh, be level to where your, your turning ability and bending ability. So I think you're still going to have, um, you know, all the same issues even with a bedless bridle. I don't know if I answered it or not. Um, Thank you very much. A bit forward, the, the further forward, the, the tongue and the, and the bars. Um, some of these bridles, or, or excuse me, bits that are very narrow, I think, are the ones that I have, I've seen more cuts in the tongue. Um, it can be because of people are too harsh with their hands. It can be because they stepped on the reins and pulled down and it just sliced the tongue. Uh, some I've seen some horses where they tie the, the horse into a real flex position and the horse is fighting it and they can cut their tongue that way. Um, the bars have a tendency, the bars is the, is the bony structure where there are no teeth in front of the teeth before you get to the, maybe the canines. That, um, and those bars can be damaged by a bit if it's too heavy, banging on it too much. And we can eventually get bone spurs underneath the gum line. Uh, you can find them with radiographs and sometimes I actually have to remove them, smooth them out. Um, but I've had them to where there's major lacerations just from the bit hitting the bars. So. Uh, the, the bit can cause trauma that way, too. Uh, once we get to the incisors, um, that's actually my favorite part of the mouth, you know, after I've balanced the back end. Um, if you really watch a horse when he's got his mouth closed, there's full incisor contact. There's two planes that you have to pay attention to, the side-to-side -side plane. Um, hopefully it's level with the, uh, I try to make it level with the TMJ. You can look at the forehead and, and kind of get your your level uh, look to it. Um, 
And that, that gets you uh, at least side-to-side -side motion, and we want that straight and even. Um, there's there's different malocclusions that they can get, um, ventral curves, dorsal curves, so what the, the occlusal surface looking at it straight from the front will look like a smile or a frown. Diagonals are the ones where they're higher on one side versus the other. So uh, it's kind of a diagonal line across instead of a straight line. Um, and that's what we talked before about the, the effects of the turning ability. And I think that if you really look at them, the taller teeth on the incisors on the bottom of the mandible will be in the direction that they will turn easier on. So to address those, I actually try to make them straight. And, and I've actually had uh, many, many horses that we've actually fixed the problem where the turning ability evened out instead of having one side better than the other. You know, both of them are, were easier now. Um, I think if the jaw is offset to one direction or the other, I think they can get TMJ syndrome with, with that one also. So I actually have to watch the forehead, watch the bars, and then make the the incisor angle level with those. The other plane that we worry about is the front to back. And that's where we um, try to aim that occlusal angle towards the TMJ. So anything that, uh, like an overbite, you can picture your horse, you know, with the upper incisors longer than the lower incisors. And they're trying to grow over the edge, so they actually will create an overlap there. A uh, parrot mouth horse is probably your most dramatic example of it, but some horses are just an overbite where it's not quite uh, a parrot mouth where they don't touch at all. But that kind of a, a look um, creates a no front-to-back motion, and usually it's the front that the, the jaw cannot move in front of the, or at least slide underneath that, that upper incisor. So we try to address that to where we I will actually cut it off, remodel it to the point where it aims towards the TMJ. And actually you can move the jaw front to back much easier. Um, attitude changes, TMJ syndrome, I think can all be in, involved in that. And uh, many horses will uh, gape their mouth open when, they, when you ask them to flex if they can't move that lower jaw forward. So, once we got to the incisors, hopefully I've balanced everything to where um, they've, they're actually more comfortable now. The side-to-side uh, -side motion that is totally, the length of the incisors is totally dependent on where the teeth touch in the back. Um, when you move the jaw sideways is where the back teeth touch. If you really look in there, there's going to be a gap in the back of the in, in the cheek teeth, they do not touch when the incisors are in full contact. The jaw has to move sideways to contact those teeth. So we want an equal motion side to side to make the back teeth contact. If they don't contact all six teeth, or as most of those as I can, then I'm also rebalancing to adjust it to where I can get all six of them uh, touching at the same time. So the basic goal is to have free motion from side to side and front to back and all the teeth contacting in the correct spot. And the horses I've been able to maintain in this process um, have appeared to be more efficient in their eating. You know, they, they look better. Their body scores are better. Uh, they appear to be happier, if I can say a horse is happier, as far as attitude and pain. Um, and, and the comfort in that they have in the bit, and they perform better as far as the turning head carriage collection. And usually after I do the balancing, I tell the people to pick a less severe bit because you don't need, you know, as much. I think it's better contact, better control with the teeth being balanced in a less severe bit. So if you're really trying to adjust their behavior, movement, headset, um, you know, by changing bits or tack, you know, like uh, adding a... Uh, tie down or something like that. I, I consider looking at the teeth too. <laughs> Any other questions? Hey, Deb, we're going back to you now. Yep, thank you very much. I don't see any additional questions from our audience. And again, I'd like to thank
very much each of our presenters, Eileen Nessenson of Stretch Your Horse Mobile Application and Holistic Horse Body Works, Rebecca Larmer from Rebecca Larmer Training, and Dr. Steve Sunholm from Ecos Veterinary Service for sharing some time with us tonight on this really interesting topic. Our goal again wasn't to make you all experts in bidding, but to give you some good basics and understanding uh, to help you as you're working with your horse to find the right fit and, and, and type of bit to use. And we do encourage you to work with your veterinary professionals, your trainer, and with your body worker as well uh, on your needs. If you have any follow-up questions, I encourage you to submit those to any of our presenters through their websites. They're listed here on the closing slide. We will be posting the audio from this talk today as well as the presentation materials on each of these websites that will be done in the next 72 hours. So again, thank you very much for your time today attending this talk with us. Thank you very much and we will hopefully have more of these soon and we will keep you posted through our Facebook and other vehicles. Take care.